All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Your Guide to the Governor's Awards. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Katie Monahan, and joining me today is Amanda Etchison, and we are both communication strategists here at the Ohio Arts Council, and today we're here to talk about all things Governor's Awards. Um, important to note, this is not us in the picture here. This is actually Ronita Haas Saunders and Crystal Michelle of the Dayton Contemporary Dance Company. DCDC received the Irma Lazarus Award in 2018, and we'll learn more about the Irma and the other awards categories in just a minute. But before we dive in, there are just a few housekeep housekeeping items I need to go over. First, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode. And this just kind of helps to cut down on any feedback issues during the presentation, but that doesn't mean that you have to stay silent. If you have a question at any point during the webinar, please feel free to type it into the Q&A box in your control panel. And Amanda and I will be monitoring the questions throughout the webinar, and we'll leave plenty of time at the end to answer your questions as well. Um, secondly, if you have audio issues or trouble connecting, we recommend refreshing your browser. And if that doesn't work, try logging off and then logging back in. And finally, we are recording this webinar, and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel Friday, August 30th, tomorrow. So if you aren't able to listen to the entire thing today, or you want to go back and re-listen, or share it with a friend, et cetera, you'll be able to find it there. All right. Okay, so I think that does it for housekeeping items. Time to get down to business. Um, so as I mentioned, here we are. Um, we are Katie Monahan and Amanda Edison, your friendly OAC communication strategist. And today we're also your guides to all things Governor's Awards. We get a lot of questions about the awards and the nomination process throughout the year. And with nominations now open, we thought it would be really helpful to take a little time to kind of demystify this whole process for you. So. Let's get started. Uh, here's an overview of what we'll be talking about today. First, we'll go through a brief history of the Governor's Awards, what they are, why they matter, important dates in the different categories. Uh, secondly, nominations. We'll lead you through the process from start to finish and actually take you through the online form so there won't be any surprises when you go to make your nomination. And then we'll provide some examples of success stories, including quotes from winners and their successful nominators. Uh, then event day. Uh, we'll talk about what to expect on the day of the luncheon. There are several components, and it makes for a very exciting day of celebrating the arts in Ohio. And finally, as I mentioned, we'll leave plenty of time to answer all of your questions. All right, so uh, hi, I'm Amanda. Uh, Katie introduced me as one of the uh, communication strategists at the Ohio Arts Council. And so I am here to kind of just get us started with a little um, bit about the Governor's Awards and their history and just kind of what they are all about. So um, first, we'll actually watch a wonderful video that was created for us uh, for last year's event by the Ohio Channel. So this kind of just gives a little information about um, maybe what the, what the event is about and what the awards mean to some of our previous winners. The arts bring people together. Uh, you can't do the arts alone. You don't. Uh, a painter or a printmaker makes work. It goes in a gallery. People come to celebrate that. A performer plays to an audience. So in that community building, there is exchange. Uh, there are values that are shared. And I think that's intrinsic to what the arts do for a community. It brings us together. When you talk about the whole idea of creating a more humanistic environment, um, whether we're training our students or we're taking care of patients. The arts seems to be a natural thing to turn to. If there's any message that the arts have for us um, in this very difficult time, it is to love and care about one another, um, to treat everyone as though they were a member of your own family. For me, it meant that the work that we have done in Dayton, Ohio, has had an impact in Dayton and also across the state. Um, I think it's very powerful when your home state recognizes your effort in your home community. Um, and for me and for my family, for my co-creator, Robert, it meant the world to us. All right, 
right, so hopefully that kind of gave you a sense of what the awards are all about. So I'm just gonna go through a little bit of history about what the Governor's Awards are and kind of um, then get into the different categories and other information that you need to know. So the uh, Governor's Awards, uh, since their beginning in 1971, these awards have recognized individuals and organizations who have been vital to the growth and development of Ohio's cultural resources. Um, the awards are one of the most prestigious events in Ohio, and they showcase and celebrate exceptional Ohio artists, arts organizations, arts leaders and patrons, and business support of the arts. Um, the Governor's Awards, is kind of a fun fact, um, are actually the only uh, arts award in the state that's conferred by the governor. And um, as you saw in the video, the recipients are honored at a luncheon ceremony in Columbus. And that's where they are presented with um, this other kind of cool fact, which um, the awards that are actually given out at the event are um, pieces of original artworks created specifically for the event by an Ohio artist. And so that's always neat when we announce um, which artist was chosen. We kind of try to introduce you to their work, and they'll create um, a set of pieces that are given to these award winners. Um, so it's kind of a special takeaway uh, that the winners receive. And they also have the opportunity to share their story with art supporters statewide, um, both at the event and throughout the year that they are honored. So it's really a great um, platform for them to share kind of their art stories and how they are impacting their home communities through the arts. Uh, so just to put on your calendars a few important dates, um, the nomination deadline, I'm sure you've seen this kind of in some of our communications already, um, we will need all nominations for the upcoming event um, by Monday, September 23rd, 2019. And then looking ahead to 2020, the actual awards luncheon is scheduled for Wednesday, March 25th, 2020. It does um, kind of start in the morning and it's uh, it starts around 11 o'clock a.m., but as Katie will mention, uh, some of the the event details are a little different for the award recipients, so it's actually kind of a, a day-long, exciting time um, in Columbus for those who do receive the, the awards. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, as I promised, we'll go through the award categories. We do get a lot of questions about, like, you have a wonderful um, person or organization you want to nominate. You're just not sure where uh, you want to put their nomination in for which category. So we will go through these. Um, and, of course, if you have any questions, just feel free to, to shoot them into the Q&A portion uh, because I know this part does get a little, uh, a little tricky. So we'll start off with arts administration. So these are... Um, individuals who have shown sustained, impactful, and visionary leadership of an arts organization. Arts education, um, this one is actually one of a couple categories that can be won by either an individual person or um, an organization. We have had both. Um, so this category um, recognizes individuals or organizations that have made significant contributions through leadership and creativity to advance arts education in Ohio schools and community organizations. And then arts patron, um, again, this one kind of can be uh, an individual. We've had couples, we've had family foundations. Um, these are uh, people who have over time sustained and enhanced the arts in their community or the state of Ohio through their contributions of their time, effort, or financial resources. So this one's kind of interesting because I feel like a lot of times when you think of arts patrons, you think about um, you know important donors and people who give their financial resources to organizations. But we have had um, some nominees and winners who um, have really invested their time and their energy and their talents to a specific cause as well. And that also makes them um, very strong candidates for this uh, category. Kind of going into our business support, this is actually split into two based on the um, size of the business that you're thinking of. So um, business support of the arts uh, large is for private or nonprofit business, government, or media organizations with 100 or more employees. The description is pretty much the same for this one, so I'll just put this on the screen too. Um, it also, there's another category for smaller organizations, so that would be fewer than 100 employees. But for both of these, we're looking for businesses that have, over time, provided um, extraordinary support to the arts locally, statewide, regionally, or nationally 
through a contribution of personnel, financial, or other resources. So um, commonly we see, you know, businesses that have uh, financially supported an arts festival in town or who are actually, you know, on the, on the ground during the event weekend volunteering their time um, or, you know, people who do sponsorships for uh, various um, programming for local arts organizations. So there's really kind of a lot of ways you can interpret this, but uh, we really are just looking for that um, business investment and support of the arts happening in local communities. Um, okay, so the last two, we have individual artists. Um, this is an Ohio artist whose work has made a significant impact on his or her discipline locally, statewide, regionally, or nationally. Um, this could be really of any artistic medium. We've had visual artists. Last year we had the wonderful Leslie Adams, a uh, very talented portrait artist uh, from Toledo. Uh, but the year before we also had um, a conductor from Miami University, Dr. Ricardo Averbach, who um, has done a lot of work composing and conducting. So it can be visual arts, performing arts, dance, theater, really um, anything that shows someone's um, really significant impact and um, legacy that they've left through their work in the arts. And then finally, this one we get a lot of questions about. It's a little different. This is the Irma Lazarus Award. So this is, again, for individuals or organizations who have helped shape public support for the arts through their work as advocates and have brought national and international recognition to Ohio through sustained dedication to artistic excellence. So these are people who really have had an international impact uh, through the work that they do and that bring um, international and national attention to the great work that's being done in the arts in our state in Ohio. So um, we have a couple more examples about that uh, a little further on, but uh, it's definitely an important award and we've had wonderful um, nominees and winners in this category in the past that uh, really shows the reach of the arts in our state. So um, this is the first of a couple quotes that you'll start to see uh, during this presentation. We just thought it would be nice to share some words uh, directly from some of our previous winners and nominators. So this is from uh, Dee Lynn Myers of Ensemble Theater Cincinnati. They won the um, Arts Education Award last year. And so this uh, quote, I think, really just does a great job showing the impact of the award. So the award means something different to a lot of our winners, but I think Lynn does a really great job here explaining, um, she compares it to the Tony Award. So she explains how much of an impact she sees this having on ensemble theater now, but then she also is focusing on what this um, award and what winning this award will do to help enhance the organization's mission going forward. So I think it's just really eloquently stated just how um, important these Governor's Awards are for a lot of our um, artists and organizations throughout the state. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about how to make a nomination. And here are our wonderful 2019 Governor's Awards for the Arts winners who all, of course, had successful nominators. And so now that you're familiar with the categories, you're ready to start prepping your nomination and hopefully follow in those successful nominators' footsteps. And there are basically four steps to completing a nomination. So the first one is to review the award categories and determine your nominee. Um, usually what we hear, and Amanda mentioned this, is that people have a specific person or organization in mind for a nomination, but they're not quite sure which category is the best fit. Um, so now that you are all experts on the categories, uh, you should hopefully have some clarity there, but if you're still struggling to kind of figure out where your person or organization might fall, uh, I want you to know you can always, of course, call one of us and we can kind of help you talk, talk through that. We've done that with people before. Um, you know, we can't write your nomination or anything for you, but we're happy to kind of, kind of help you talk through some, some questions you may have. Um, next. Write your 350 to an 800 word nomination narrative. Um, so this is um, kind of a description of the impact that your nominee has created in the arts in Ohio. Then uh, collect up to five one page support letters. So these are letters from others in your community who can kind of you know, back up your narrative and demonstrate the impact as well. Um, we encourage you to provide a copy of your nomination narrative to the folks that you choose to write support letters so that you can kind of be sure that your message is a jibe. Um, and these letters should be one page in length and in a PDF format. 
And finally, once you kind of have all these things pulled together in one place, it's time to head to the website and complete the nomination form and upload your support materials. And just so there are no surprises, uh, we're going to take you through a sample form now. Um, and again, if you guys have any questions as we go through, um, just let, let me know um, and we can stop and, and pause for you. All right. Oh, whoops, technical difficulty. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Okay, now on to the nomination form. So you can find the nomination form on our website. Um, the address is listed there. And um, let's see, let's see. Once you, okay, so here we go. We're actually going to take you through this form. So once you're in the form, um, you're going to enter your name, your address, and the nominee's contact information. And so it's important to note that you're going to want to have all of that information handy before you begin the process as well. It'll just make life easier on you. Um, so we're going to go through this form and for today's purposes we're going to nominate our super talented supervisor, Operations and Public Affairs Director Justin Nigro. So we're just going to go through here. I'm nominating him so we'll put in my email and hmm, what category should we nominate him in? We'll do arts admin. Okay, perfect. All right. So we're nominating an individual. Type in their name. I think we get a lot of questions about um, the nomination form, and um, I think people think that it's going to be a little more scary than it is, and so we just thought it would be helpful to go through this and show you that, you know, it's a lot of the basic information. The hard work is uh, ahead of time when you're collecting your, your support letters and writing your nomination narrative. Um, Justin from Ashtabula, we'll put that in there. Fun fact. All right. Um, so a tip, the nomination narrative, unlike the support letters, your nomination narrative um, is typed directly into the online form. So what we recommend is when you're compiling all of your materials, type your nomination narrative up in a Word document. That'll be helpful for a number of reasons. One, you can do your word count and make sure that you fall within your word count because if you go over the form will not accept it. So that's one important thing. And two, once you're in this form, there's no option to save it and return to it. Um, so it's just helpful to have everything typed up ahead of time so you can just copy and paste it right in here and get it all done in one fell swoop. Um, so right here um, is where you upload your PDFs of your support letters. So we'll just show you. So you'll just click on this button and kind of navigate to wherever you have all of your letters um, saved. There we go. And then you just have to prove that you're not a robot. And you can go ahead and submit your nomination. All right, so that's pretty simple. You'll get a confirmation uh, message once that you can see here once you um, submitted it just to make sure that everything went through. Um, if you get any kind of error message, we've had some people who, um, we had someone who was trying to submit an award from Canada, and we found out that their phone number wasn't being accepted in our form, which was something we didn't realize. So if you have any kind of technical issues like that, absolutely feel free to call me, and we can try and um, troubleshoot that. All right, so um, we covered some of the common questions uh, kind of through that little demo, but we do have a couple just um, general tips and helpful hints that might help you as you start to prepare to embark on the nominating journey. So the number one tip that we can give you is to just uh, plan ahead. It uh, makes it a lot harder um, you know, with technology and everything if you do procrastinate. So we just really encourage you to start thinking about um, how you're going to approach this process. So I think it's a great step that you're all here right now mm -hmm. listening to this. That's great. So hopefully this gives you kind of the uh, inspiration that you need and the, the tools that you need to really kind of delve into this process um, in earnest. So yeah, it is easier to complete the nomination and get solid, compelling support letters if you're not rushing. Uh, you are going to have to probably reach out to um, a couple people in the community to write these one-page support letters. So um, the more time that you can give someone, of course, it's just um, it, it will be easier so that you're not scrambling at the last minute to um, track down these kind of uh, remaining letters and just trying to figure out where they are. 
having ample time to work with others in the community and share the diversity of support letters and provide insight to their narrative, which we'll get into as well, just why that's uh, so important to have a diversity of voices in your um, nomination packet. Um, speaking of the narrative we mentioned, um, Previously, during our trip through the forum, that um, it really is helpful to type out your nomination narrative in Word. Um, if you don't have the uh, Microsoft Office suite, you can also use Google Docs or even just like your Notepad app, something that you can just save and make sure you go back to. Um, we hate hearing <laughs> about uh, the technological headaches of if the form just decides that you've taken too long and it decides to refresh and your work is gone, um, or if you know it just doesn't uh, save the way you want. So it. Uh, it is just helpful to have that as a backup in case something does go wrong. Um, not that we anticipate anything going <laughs> wrong, but it's just it'll help you kind of feel probably less stressed about the whole thing too. Um, something else to just keep in mind, uh, double check the word counts, page limits, and required file formats. Um, it doesn't happen often, but uh, sometimes uh, the word count will, um, if you write too many words and try to put it into the online form, it might cut you off and not let you finish uh, some of your thoughts. So you just make sure you're really paying attention to the word limitations there so that all your wonderful writing does not um, get cut off and we get to see exactly what you want us to see. Um, and then finally, uh, just this is really important, you cannot save the nomination and come back to it later, which I think we, we also mentioned. So just make sure you have all the information you need to finish it in one go. Um, I've heard uh, a lot of people just will have a gov governor's awards folder on their desktop ready to go where they can just keep going back to that uh, one location so that they know that they have everything in there and it just makes the process go pretty quickly. So once you have all the, the um, required documents ready to go, it really shouldn't take very long to go through the form. It's mostly, as you saw, just filling in contact information and everything. Um, so hopefully that will make the, the final step of this process uh, less stressful if you have that ready to go. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention when we were in the forum that we get um, some nervousness about from people, when you copy and paste your nomination narrative into that text box, you will lose any formatting you have, and that is okay. We, we know that that's what happens, and so we don't judge you for that. We know that's, that, that that's what's coming. <laughs> um, so when you do your nomination narrative, you don't have to worry about having, you know, like a header or a logo or anything like that. It's just straight text. Um, so don't don't get worried when you go to copy that into the box and you don't have the formatting that you had in your Google or Word doc or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> so again, like also with uh, underlining or italics, that those won't show up there either. So just don't fret too much if uh, when you do copy paste it in, it is in plain text. So um, it it's not a you problem. It's the form. So. Yeah. Exactly. All right, so again, we're going to just kind of um, share some advice that we received from some previous winners and their nominators. So this is Phyllis Gorfain. She was our 2019 Arts Administration Award winner, um, and she was nominated by Diane Kendig, a writer and poet. And so we just asked Diane kind of how she approached um, getting such great nomination um, materials ready to go. They had such a wealth of diverse letters um, from anyone from people living uh, in the community that Phyllis resides in to the men she works with at Grafton Correctional Institution to have really powerful um, narratives from them talking about the impact of her uh, Shakespeare programs. So this is kind of what uh, Diane decided to share with us and how she went about collecting all these wonderful uh, letters. Um, just a few key points from this quote that we just really want to highlight is just uh, her emphasis on the diversity of letters, like we mentioned. Um, she really makes a point to tie the letters that she chooses to include back to what she wrote. What, sorry, what she wrote in the nomination um, narrative, which just strengthens the overall application. And she mentions how important it is to be inclusive of all the groups who had something to share about Phyllis. She mentions that just so many people love Phyllis and the work that she does. So I'm sure it was really difficult for her to try to choose the, the five um, letters that she wanted to include, but I think she really did a good job balancing all of the different communities that Phyllis touches through her work um, to really make a comprehensive package of nomination material. 
All right, so frequently asked questions. We um, we get a lot of questions right around this time, so we thought we'd kind of deal with the ones that we get most often. This one actually came up the other day. Um, unfortunately, we do not accept posthumous nominations. Um, we get a lot of questions about self-nominations. Self-nominations self are permitted. There's no rules against it. We do kind of recommend, though, that it's, we would advise um, you know, if you're an individual artist or something and you are looking to be nominated, it's it's better to approach someone in the community and have them nominate you. It just makes for a stronger nomination. Now, on the flip side of that, we have had instances where, like, an executive director will nominate their organization, and that's a little bit different. So, for example, that um, Amanda mentioned Ensemble Theater. So last year, um, D. Lynn Myers, who's the Producing Artistic Director for Ensemble, nominated the organization as a whole. And so that ended up being very successful. So that's definitely an, um, an approach that, that has proven successful in the past that's a little more advisable than maybe an individual nominating themselves. Um, then we have surprise nominations. So what we mean by this is I know a lot of people think it would be really great um, to kind of surprise somebody. I, I want to surprise Amanda, so I'm going to nominate her, and I'm not going to tell her that I'm doing it. And she'll be so shocked, you know, when she walks in in uh, March and finds out. It's a really nice idea, um, but it doesn't always work out that way because, so we send communication to all of the nominators and the nominees, um, whether their nominations are successful or not. Um, and there's not really any way that we can kind of pick and choose who that goes to. So at some point, the nominees will be notified of the fact that they were nominated. Um, so we just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up on that. Also, um, also important to note, and I think we mentioned this earlier, is in order to actually be a winner and accept the award, you have to be able to attend the awards luncheon in March. And so you'll want to be sure that the person that you nominate is actually able to attend that, and um, that's kind of hard to do in a sneaky way. Um, so that's 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 what we mean by that one. Support materials. We get a lot of questions of people saying, "Just one-page letters? Is that really all we need?" Yes, that is really all we need. Um, no other materials, um, pictures, news clips, resumes, anything like that. Don't don't even worry about it. We don't need any of that stuff. Um, that actually may work against you. You know, follow the rules <laughs> is kind of our big big point. The support letters um, really go a long way, and you don't have to have five. You can have up to five if you only have two or three. That's okay too. But those support letters really are um, what matters most in this. Um, as far as the the extra materials, we don't need anything else. Um, as Amanda mentioned, a diversity of viewpoints and authors for the support letters is key. Um, it's, it's a lot more impactful to hear from different voices rather than to hear from five people at Ohio State. Or, you know, it's very, it's nice to hear, you know, like maybe one person at Ohio State and one person who, who's, you know, been, a, who's worked with the nominee in some other aspects. That's, that's really important and it makes for us a stronger nomination. Uh, I mentioned this before, winners must be present to accept the award. Uh, repeat nominations, this is a big one. Do not get discouraged if you make a nomination and it is not successful the first time. Um, it is a highly competitive process and there, there's a lot of great work being done in the arts in Ohio and it definitely has taken you know multiple tries for some people and we've had instances in the past um, we'll talk about uh, one of those in a minute, but where it's taken multiple times of nominating the same person to, to be successful. But please keep at it. Do not let it discourage you. Do not um, throw in the towel. It's definitely worth it to kind of to, to go back and, and try again next year if this year doesn't work out for you. All right. So um, again, we just kind of want to leave you guys uh, after this uh, session just with um, kind of the inspiration to get out there and start putting together your nominations. And we can't wait to um, just see what everyone comes up with this year. So we are just going to share now just a few success stories that were uh, submitted to us from our previous award winners and nominators. So 
I love this picture. This is Sierra Leone 2018 Community Development and Participation winner with her nominator, Faraha Henry Jones, who um, took the time to send us um, some nice advice for that situation that Katie was just talking about. So Faraha actually um, submitted a nomination on behalf of Sierra for a couple years in a row, and she, as I mentioned, was successful in 2018. And it was just, I think it just made it that much um, more exciting that she and Sierra got to come to the event. They pretty much came every year um, when they were nominating or just to uh, experience the event and celebrate the arts with everyone. Uh, but this is um, kind of part of an email that she sent me that reflected on some of the advice she'd like to share to those out there who are maybe thinking about um, resubmitting a nomination that they submitted in the past or um, just those who need a little extra encouragement. So just to kind of briefly go over what she uh, recommends. Um, the first one I love because I think uh, to go about the nomination process, obviously you are passionate about the um, person you've decided or the organization you've decided to nominate. Um, She's really just talking about here about being um, keyed into that passion and that deeply rooted belief that your nominee um, has been impactful within the Ohio arts community through their unique and unparalleled work. So um, just having that kind of driving force, I think, will really motivate you and shine through in your letter, as she says here. Um, this one I think is important. So Faraha is <laughs> a professor of English and writing, so a lot of her advice is very practical in terms of writing the nomination letters. So I love this that um, this is an opportunity, submitting the nomination again, is an opportunity for you to look at your nomination letters and your nomination uh, narratives and to adjust. Uh, maybe the, your nominee has done something in the past year that you want to add. So that's a great opportunity for you to kind of freshen up the, uh, the application and nomination and make sure it's um, the most up-to-date and best uh, representation of your nominee. Um, here she also mentions the importance of speaking a diversity of additional letters that you can attach. So you have the opportunity to attach five uh, support letters. Those are kind of just um, ways to bolster what you say in your nomination narrative. So this is a great um, opportunity to get those other voices in there. Uh, we know, you know, the, the narrative is restricted with uh, word count. So this is your opportunity to get um, some different uh, points of view in there that maybe couldn't all be expressed within uh, 350 to 800 words. Um, and then finally, again, uh, for having our wonderful English extraordinaire, uh, she um, obviously just has um, the importance of getting feedback. So again, once you um, start your nomination narrative, you're starting early enough that you're not rushed, that gives you plenty of time to uh, kind of get other viewpoints to look at what you've prepared and just see if it could be strengthened in any way. So those are all great tips from Faraha. So we're really appreciative, appreciative that she took the time to share those. Um, here is our, uh, another uh, great example. This is the dream team. So this is Derek McDowell and RJ Thompson. Um, RJ won the Community Development and Participation Award last year at the Governor's Awards. And so we uh, talked to Derek about why he thought RJ was such a great person to nominate. And I think this really encapsulates the passion that Faraha also mentioned, um, and also the, the understanding of the impact of what uh, this award can bring on a broader scale. So here, um, Derek is talking about how his friend RJ has really been great at um, using creative arts and design to really elevate the um, branding of the city of Youngstown through the City of You campaign. And I love that at the end, he's really just talking about how getting this award um, really kind of propels the vision and dedication that RJ and the City of You team has by putting this um, great work out there for um, people of Youngstown, but also of Ohio and the world <laughs> uh, to understand the really great things that are happening in the communities in the arts here in Ohio. So I love that kind of forward thinking vision and just the, the pure passion that you can see in this quote that he truly believes in the work that RJ is doing. And we just want to see that passion in all of the, the nominations that we receive because we know there's so much amazing work going on out there. And then um, we have one more. So this is, as we mentioned before, um, Crystal Michelle on the left and uh, Ronita Haas Founders on the right. And um, Ronita accepted the Irma Lazarus Award in 2018 on behalf of the Dayton Contemporary Dance Company. Um, 
And so this is kind of what she had to say about the impact of this award for DCDC and, again, just how she sees this award um, providing an opportunity to celebrate and showcase the story and mission of DCDC. They were having their 50th anniversary celebration the same year that they received the Governor's Award, so it was a big year for them. And she um, obviously really holds this award and winning this award in high esteem as an opportunity to further um, showcase the great work that's being done in Dayton and through DCDC. So we love seeing that um, kind of uh, looking forward to how they are going to use winning this award and use this platform that they received through receiving this award um, to, to better their community and to better their organization. So I think it's just a, a smart way of looking at um, the impact that these awards can really have. All right, so next steps. Um, you've submitted your nomination and um, you've all made it this far into this webinar, so I hope you all plan on following through and submitting amazing nominations. Um, so you've submitted your nomination, what happens next? All right, so first, notification. Um, all nominees and nominators will be notified of their award status in late fall 2019. I kind of mentioned this before, everyone will get a communication from us um, letting them know if they won or, or not. Um, and then next, uh, after we make that announcement to the nominators and nominees, then we will go public on our Ohio Arts Council communication channels, so Twitter, Facebook, um, our newsletter, et cetera. Last year, Amanda made like a really cool, you premiered, what was it, like a countdown mm -hmm. on Facebook, kind of drum up some excitement um, where people could, could tune in and watch the winners um, being revealed live, and that was kind of, that was kind of fun. Um, next. Uh, video vignette. Okay, this is like where things start to get really fun, um, especially for the winners. So we work with the folks over at the Ohio Channel to produce uh, three-ish minute video vignettes for each of the winners, and these videos feature the winners and provide a look into the impact that the winner has created for the arts in Ohio. And um, we work with the winners to pick a time and location that works best for them, so don't worry, you know, we will come to you. We try and make things as easy as possible. Um, and then these video vignettes are actually played during the awards luncheon before each winner takes the stage to accept their award, which is really cool. Actually, one of my favorite things about the awards day is watching the winners see their videos for the first time. It's, it's really fun to see. And finally, registration. So tickets for the luncheon go on sale late winter, early spring 2020. We don't have an exact date set just yet, but um, you know, stay tuned to our Facebook and Twitter, and, and if you subscribe to our newsletter, you'll, you'll get more information on that as it becomes available. All right, and so now we're finally on to the actual event day, um, here, what to expect. And this is a shot um, inside the, the kind of ballroom area of Athenaeum. As you can see, there are a lot of people in there um, supporting the arts. It's a really cool day. Um, again, save the date. You can see a little bit more of kind of the spirit of the awards in these photos. Um, it's a really great time to kind of meet people. And I think um, Amanda kind of alluded to this before, but even if you don't win, even if your nomination isn't successful, we really encourage you to come anyways um, because it's just a great way to celebrate the arts in Ohio and meet other people who are passionate about supporting the arts in Ohio. And the day just carries a lot of inspiration and energy. And so we encourage you that even, you know, if this isn't your year, please, please come and check it out. It's, it's a great event. We may be a little biased, but it, I think it is anyway. Um, all right. So, as you can see from that picture of the, the main room at the Athenaeum, this event is a pretty big deal. Um, each year, the Governor's Awards draws more than 700 arts supporters and elected officials for a celebration of Ohio's artistic excellence. Um, the luncheons typically held at the Athenaeum in downtown in 2020 will be no different. Um, winners get to sit with other award recipients and so that allows for a lot of really cool connections to be made. Um, winners also participate in group photos and other networking opportunities throughout the day. Um, the awards presentation features artwork by an Ohio artist um, who creates the art specifically for the event, and we'll show you an example of this in just a minute. And finally, winners are invited on stage to accept their award and deliver a one-minute speech, and like I said, this is when the video vignettes are played. And so, as I mentioned, here's an example of last year's artwork and the artist 
who created last year's awards, Carolyn Roundtree. So she is Columbus based and she created this really beautiful, vibrant um, series of prints on watercolor paper for the winners. And each winner just received a different print. Um, this one was, you may recognize from the logo for the governor's awards last year. So that's just, as Amanda said, it's just another really kind of cool, um, cool aspect of the event. And next, we're going to take a look at a great example of a winner acceptance speech. So who you're going to see is Don Reddick. He's the Director of Community Affairs and the President of Owens Corning Foundation. And Don accepted the 2019 Business Support of the Arts Award on behalf of Owens Corning um, this past May. So we'll take a look at how he did his Thanks very much. I, I will use my 60 seconds to redirect the spotlight to some of the organizations that we just talked about in this video, the wonderful cultural and arts organizations that call Toledo home. Uh, certainly our Arts Commission, Toledo Opera, uh, Imagination Station, the Valentine Theater, Toledo Ballet, Toledo Symphony, and of course our uh, incredible Toledo Museum of Art. Um, you know, the question is never, should we support these organizations? The question is, why would you not support these organizations? As we said in the video, um, these are the organizations that are leading the revitalization of Toledo that make our community richer, more vibrant, exciting, and meaningful. So on behalf of the 1,200 employees at Owens Corning who call Toledo home, thanks to all of you for what you do every day. All right, so a couple of things to note about the speeches. Um, I think Don did a really great job. We, we tell winners to, um, in the interest of time, to please keep their remarks to 60 seconds, to write around 60 seconds. And I think Don um, did a really great job of keeping things short and sweet while still delivering a, a heartfelt message. You know, when he said, the question was never, should, should we support these organizations? It's why, why would we not? And so um, it was just a really good example of, of how to craft your remarks and, you know, get them in there in that timely fashion. Um, and uh, one other thing that I wanted to note, we get some questions on for winners, and, and we work with the winners directly leading up to this um, to kind of fill in all of this information, but we get a lot of questions of, can we bring a group on stage? Can we, you know, have a whole bunch of people? And as much as we would love to be able to do that for everybody, um, we are, the, the show kind of runs on a tight timeline, so we just ask that you pick one person to represent if you have an organization, for example, like Don, um, one person um, to go up there and accept the award. Um, you're more than welcome to point out others in the audience, though, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's, I think, a good part of the video vignettes, too. The Ohio Channel does a great job really covering comprehensively the stories that we are receiving through these nomination narratives. So that really kind of gives the option and opportunity to show um, the impact of what these individuals and winners do. Um, and that kind of opens up, as Don kind of alluded to in his speech, that a lot of the important aspects of the stories that are shared are covered in those video vignettes. So um, that, that hopefully gives you a little bit more creative freedom to work on how you want your story portrayed through B-roll and interviews in that way. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good point. And um, I think we also forgot to mention that when we do the videos, we obviously interview the winner, but we also ask them to identify um, a secondary interview person to be featured in the video. And usually that's their nominator. Um, it doesn't have to be, but, um, but usually they, they end up choosing their nominator and that's just another great way to add another perspective um, into those videos. So um, I think that's all we had planned. Um, I guess we'll just go ahead and open up the floor for questions. So if anybody has a question, absolutely feel free to type it into the Q&A. Um, into the Q&A box um, on your panel there, and we will do our best to answer. So, all right. So, uh, oh, okay, here's one. So, what if the same person or organization is nominated twice? Um, so, we get this question a lot, actually. So, say Amanda, um, say I'm looking through the nominations, and I see that Amanda has been nominated by one person for individual artists, and then somebody else came in and also nominated her for individual artists. Usually what I'll do if I, if I notice that as the nominations roll in is we'll kind of contact both nominating parties and see if maybe they would like to work together to, to combine forces and create a super nomination. Um, it's just 
stronger to do it that way. Um, so that's kind of what we would recommend. Or if you if you are in your area and you're kind of thinking about nominating someone, you might want to do you know asking around and talk around and just kind of see if anyone else has planned on nominating them as well. Um, do you have anything you want to add to that? You can add to that. Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. I think uh, we typically do, and that's a kind of another, I know we're really hammering this point home, that's another kind of <laughs> important uh, consideration to make because um, if you do kind of plan ahead and, and not procrastinate, this does give you uh, an opportunity to kind of get those, uh, combine those forces in the best way that, that makes the most sense. So uh, yeah, we, we definitely want to encourage as many people to nominate as um, as desired. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's really no big deal. Uh, don't feel don't feel weird about uh, if you do get a call from one of us and are just notified that maybe someone had the same idea as you and, and thought of a great person to nominate. So yeah. Um, here's one. So there was a category of award last year that had to do with community partnership. We did not see it today in the oh, webinar. No. <laughs> we forgot to add <laughs> Um, that's a really good catch. Yes. Community develop partnership and development. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> community, develop community development and participation. Yes. So yeah, that's actually a really popular one. So it's kind of ironic that we forgot to mention that. But um, <laughs> yeah, so community development and participation can be won by I believe both an individual or an organization. So um, it really is focused on the impact that the arts have in building community and offering important creative resources to uh, a group of people. So we actually, funnily enough, did a lot of our success stories. A lot of those winners <laughs> were winners of the, 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 um, that category. Yeah. So um, I'll just give you an example maybe, and that can help um, maybe explain the, the category a little bit more. So um, we talked about RJ. Uh, I guess we'll talk about RJ again. So he um, really worked to brand the city of Youngstown through creative marketing and through design um, to really create a comprehensive uh, vision for how they would like uh, the city of Youngstown, Ohio to be portrayed. So um, I think that really shows creativity and the use of the arts to really build a community and an identity that people who are living in that community really feel proud of. So I think that's like maybe the most, um, I don't know, like straightforward example mm -hmm. of, of how it is, but we've seen plenty of oh, examples Ronnie. of, yeah, uh, or of um, last year's winner, Ronnie Burks, who used um, arts programming within her role as warden of the Ohio Reformatory for Women to uh, provide arts opportunities for those incarcerated women um, and really kind of bring those arts opportunities into an environment that maybe isn't the most approachable. So um, it really is kind of using your resources as a community organizer or as a community leader to bring the arts to your community in an impactful way. And so, yeah, if you have any other questions about that too, we can definitely answer that. If you just want to reach out to, to me or Katie, we can um, give plenty more examples. That's like one of my favorite ones, so it's really Kind of unfortunate that you yeah. that. So yes, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you. Catch. Yeah, it's definitely still a category. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we have another question about um, how we understand that uh, the nomination process is a little intimidating. So I think this touches on it. Um, this uh, person is a, an arts supporter um, who might be a little uh, intimidated by the process and just would like to know. Um, what qualifications do you need to have to nominate someone for such a prestigious award? Mm -hmm. um, really, <laughs> this is really, and um, that's what I, part of hosting this webinar was we wanted to um, help people understand that this is not some exclusive, you know, like super exclusive, top level, you know, crazy event. Like we want this to be, this is all about community and art supporters in Ohio and people coming together. And we want this to be accessible to everyone. So um, really the only qualification I would say that you need to have is you need to be passionate about the arts and have somebody that you think is really making a difference in your community, a person, an organization. Um, and then to be able to write your nomination narrative and collect your letters, um, it's really, it's anybody's game. This is, we want this to, we want, um, all different voices to be represented and heard, and really that's what makes it interesting. Um, we want to hear those stories from the corners of the state that maybe we don't normally hear from, like, and, and we don't know what they are, so we need you to tell us. So um, definitely do not let this 
process intimidates you, we want to hear from you. If there is someone out there that you think is deserving of this award, then that's all the qualifications you need to, to nominate someone. Yeah, and I think that goes back to um, there's different approaches uh, to putting together maybe your first nomination. I think something that would help um, maybe in this situation would be perhaps not having it be a surprise like Katie was talking about. Um, maybe it would be helpful to, for your first stab at nominating to work with the person or organization that you're thinking of submitting a nomination for. Maybe combine your resources that way and really get to um, the important parts that they want you to highlight. I think um, just having that feedback, kind of like what Faraha talked about in her um, in her four points that she sent to us as suggestions, um, it's, it's sometimes helpful being able to combine, um, combine forces and put together a really strong narrative that way. Um, if maybe that's not an option for you, um, or if you don't have um, the connections to kind of sit down with, if you're like maybe uh, nominating a business and, and um, you just don't really have those connections that you feel comfortable utilizing to work with the actual uh, nominee themselves, you can also maybe uh, make a group of, of nominators within the community. We do see that sometimes where um, arts leaders or art supporters in certain cities or communities will come together, maybe decide that they want to really throw their support behind a specific or individual or organization in the community. And then that, there you go, you have like four or five support letters right there and you can draft a nomination narrative together. So I think those are two maybe ways to think about approaching it so it's less scary. We do know, um, you know, for your first time, it might be helpful to have some, some support in that way. And of course, you can always call us too. Um, we would be happy to connect you with um, maybe some of our previous winners or nominators who can provide more advice um, or, you know, just give you kind of reassurances that you are choosing the right category and things like that, so. Yeah, no, I think those are all really great points. Um, one other one is, um, can someone who has already won in the past win again? You can take <laughs> It is rare, but there are no rules against it. So um, we do have people who, you know, have called and checked to see, you know, if this person won in this category before. Um, it, it is rare, but, you know, if they've been doing some really great stuff lately and it's different from what they've been doing in the past or maybe, maybe you're nominating them in a different category, um, you know, it's, it's not outside the realm of pos uh, possibility, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we do have um, historic information for you if you are interested to see maybe if someone in your community has received an award before or in what category, um, you can contact uh, either me or Katie again, and we have a nice spreadsheet uh, for, I think, pretty much all the years. All the way back, yeah, yeah, you'll see that some of the categories have changed a little bit, but um, that sometimes helps inform people as they're making the decisions of who they want to nominate. So uh, we'd be happy to provide that to anyone who needs it. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that that does it for today's presentation. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again to everyone who listened in today. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact either one of us. Um, I'm the main point of contact for the Governor's Awards, but Amanda is obviously very knowledgeable. She handled this before I got here, and so she's always available to answer questions as well. Um, and so now that you are all um, experts on the Governor's Awards nominations, we look forward to seeing all of your wonderful nominations in September. Um, thank you again for attending today, and we will see you next month. Thanks.